Welcome everyone uh, here again with Rick Rule continuing our discussion uh, today on the developers and focusing on the capital stack. So uh, welcome, Rick. How are you? Albert, I'm fine. Thank you once again for causing the classroom series uh, to occur. Uh, I'm delighted with the commentary that we've received on social media around the utility to investors and speculators of this series. So thank you for that. Yes, uh, we appreciate it very much, Rick, and uh, getting lots of emails too, actually. So it's not just uh, comments to the video, getting lots of emails with uh, grateful people. Uh, we had a very fruitful discussion uh, uh, last time, it was a couple weeks ago, on the developers, and it just uh, raised more questions. And uh, one of the topics is the capital structure of these companies, which you want to talk about today. Uh, one thing I want to ask you before you start is, uh, from which perspective are you going to be discussing this? From the investor, from the company, uh, or both simultaneously? How are you going to approach this topic? I, I would say that there's a difference before I've written a check between the investor and the company. A afterwards, the perspectives are much more similar. So <laughs> I, I think it depends on whether you own it yet or you don't. Uh, it also probably depends on how closely you believe your interests and the management interests are aligned. Uh, if you are dealing with uh, a promotional group like the Lundines or Ross Beatty, where you see your interests and their interests completely aligned, then you need to differentiate less between the check writer and the check casher. But in every circumstance, Albert, in the rural classroom, uh, I will be taking the investor's perspective rather than the company's perspective. Okay, uh, so if you wouldn't mind, just start with a, a few definitions and then um, just launch into the discussion. Well, first of all, capital stack is, as you suggest, the capital structure. Uh, it's a discussion of the capitalization of the companies, the debts, the off-balance sheet assets and liabilities, all those types of things, really the capital structure of the company. And understanding the capital structure uh, of the company uh, particularly with regards to capital adequacy uh, and both the risks and the opportunities present in the sources and allocation of capital is an important part of understanding the risks and perhaps the opportunities uh, associated with development activities. We're going to get in the weeds today, Albert. Uh, and so people who are looking for a light discussion are going to be very disappointed. Uh, people who aren't looking for a light discussion are probably going to be delighted. Uh, the capital stack is where all the sin is in these companies. And we'll try to, uh, we'll try to, un we'll try to go through the layers uh, pretty thoroughly. I guess the uh, beginning thing that you need to dis that you need to think about when you're examining the capital uh, the capital stack is the adequacy. Uh, in other words, when you are looking at a development project, be it at the preliminary economic assessment, the pre-feasibility, the feasibility, the construction, how much money is required to get you to successful economic completion? How much money does the company have? How much ancillary money will the company need for non-project expenses, things like general and administrative expense to get to cash generation? And where will the economic shortfall, uh, where will the cash shortfall, if it exists, be acquired from and at what cost? Understanding the capital stack is at first, at least, uh, all about capital adequacy. Uh, and so it's important that you look at that. Not all money is created equally either. Uh, some parts of the capital stack can be acquired from investors who are advantageous to you. Other parts uh, or other sources of capital can be dangerous to you. There is such a thing as a value-added investor, particularly in the equity side. And it's important when one looks at the capital uh, stack to look at the sources of money, not just in terms of their adequacy, but also in terms of their cost and whether or not the investor brings more than money. 
there are certain investors, as an example, in the debt side of the transaction that have a reputation for being loan to own investors, which is to say that they make fairly aggressive advances in terms of loan to value because from their point of view, a default would be a good thing. It allows them to be the equity owner of the deposit rather than merely being a lender. To the extent that a company that you have invested in accepts project financing from a loan to own shark, uh, which is to say a very high rate advance from an investor who is actually hoping for a foreclosure, while a successful completion limits the equity that you had to put up, it does it at substantial risk. Similarly, certain types of equity investors and even certain investors in other parts of the uh, capital stack, and we'll get to that later, uh, have such a positive imprimatur themselves. They have such great reputations that their investment in the property is seen as a validation of the property. As an example, uh, when my friend Ross Beatty invests in a pre-feasibility stage company, buys 10% of the company, 15% of the company, the fact that he has done that is regarded by the investment community as a validation. The stock often goes up, which is to say Ross's own reputation lowers his subsequent cost of capital. Similarly, if royalty financing is provided by, say, Franco Nevada, or streaming financing is provided by Silver Wheaton, the market regards those two capital sources as being both honorable and sophisticated. And the market views the validation of the project that occurs as a consequence of the infusion of capital uh, from highly reputable investors as being a de-risking event and a validating event. So it's useful in the context of examining the capital stack uh, uh, to keep in mind that one is doing it, first of all, for capital adequacy, for the cost of capital, and also for the advantages or disadvantages of various perturbations of the capital stack and various suppliers of capital. Uh, Rick, is this a good time for a question or two? Any time, Albert. You've yeah. done a good job of being the jockey in these so far. So, Okay. Um, so let's start with the first priority then, capital adequacy. Um, you you obviously don't want too much. There, there's such thing as too much capital. So what? how much do you like to see how, in, in terms of, I, I guess, uh, you know, the project and the task that, that lies ahead for the company? Um, how, how much of that do you like to see financed, let's say at the early stage? Let's say at a pre-feasibility, okay? So we have a quasi-developer. I'd like to see uh, enough capital raised that the unanswered questions that were raised in the pre-feasibility study can be answered and that uh, the companies can survive in terms of general and administrative expense over the period of time that is necessary to answer the questions. So let's say the, that the preliminary economic assessment gives uh, a company a, a target size, an indicated target size of a million ounces of gold. And they specify that in order to upgrade this million ounces of gold from inferred to measured and indicated, a better quality uh, of data, that the company needs to do 40,000 meters of drilling. And to make the math simple, let's assume it's gonna cost them $100 a meter, which is a gross underestimate. I'm just doing it to make the numbers work. So we need $4 million in drilling capital. And this drilling capital will be expended over two years. And this company has annualized general and administrative expenses of $2 million a year. So $4 million in project expenditures, $4 million in GNA. I would very much like to see that company have $8 million in it. Uh, because if the company doesn't have the financial resources to give me a yes answer, it's unlikely I'm going to get a yes answer. And I'm investing in anticipation of a yes answer. <laughs> um, uh, 
I don't need to be grossly overcapitalized, although I do like situations in a good market where the company is willing to overcapitalize. Uh, if I own stock in a company at a buck uh, and I think that the company is worth two dollars and the company is able to raise money at two dollars and fifty or three dollars, I would encourage them, particularly a, a shareholder at a dollar, to take all they can get. I would very much uh, like to reduce risk by being overcapitalized, even though taking that much money and issuing that much stock might uh, reduce my upside. It may well eliminate my downside. Uh, and I think that's a very good trade off in my declining years. Um, and in terms of, of leverage, Rick, what kind of leverage ratio um, do you typically see? What's acceptable for companies at that stage of the game? That answer varies. It really depends on the economics of the project. Uh, I have seen some projects. An example would be uh, Alphaman's Bisset tin project uh, in Congo, where the returns on invested capital were so high and the certainty around the data was so high that I was willing to see them take on more debt than I otherwise would, despite the fact that the, the project was in the Congo and way, way, way back in the jungle which is to say the certainty around the project was so high and the project quality was so high that I was willing to take the risk of higher leverage because I thought the risk was manageable and I would rather have seen them uh, take on a bit too much debt than issue more equity unnecessarily. Conversely, if the project that I'm involved in is a lower quality project, but one that I think has very high optionality, which is to say, I think it will do well in a period of higher prices, and I think higher prices are, uh, will come, then I'm reducing my risk by taking more equity uh, and less debt, less leverage. So it really depends on the project quality and the time that the uh, capital that is being discussed uh, will be at risk, uh, how, how long it will be employed, how it will be replaced, and at what possible cost it'll be replaced. Okay, uh, so in that, can, can you give us a ballpark uh, figures of for that high quality project, what kind of leverage ratio would you accept? Well, certainly as a lender, <laughs> as a lender, which I have a lot of, uh, you know, obviously I have a lot of experience. I've been doing project lending in the mining business for 30 years. Uh, the rule of thumb is that I want the project debt to be something in the range of 30% or 35% of loan to value. That is the value that's been established by the bankable feasibility study. I want loan to expenditure, which is different than loan to value. I want loan to expenditure to be 60 or 65% of project expenditure, which is to say, I want to see equity keep me company. Uh, as to sort of 35 to 40 percent of total expenditure, understanding that total expenditure should be much less than total value. So there's two answers to that question. Uh, loan to value, 30 to 35 percent. Loan to expenditure, uh, 30, 35, uh, 40, per 40 percent equity, the, the balance being debt. Okay. I also like situations where in the project side, that the debt is released like it would be released on a construction loan. I want to see debt committed to a project get debt given to a management team to spend on a proportional completion basis. If the company has completed 50% uh, of the workflow, I don't want them to be in control of more than 60% of the project budget. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen too many managers who have seen that money is fung who have said that money is fungible, particularly my money, and I don't feel it to be fungible per personally. <laughs> um, okay, and then one last question uh, regarding loan to own investors. Can you just paint two scenarios? Um, uh, one lender who is hoping for foreclosure and then one that is not, and what kind of terms the company would get from each of them? What, what is the difference here? Well, the people who are doing loan to own uh, are usually willing to go much further out in terms of loan to value uh, and much further out in terms of uh, 
debt relative to equity. They're willing to do a higher rate loan because they're willing to do a workout. They're willing to own the property. They consider their debt to be at least partially quasi equity. Uh, a pure lender uh, is maybe less interested in the upside because he or she doesn't get the upside. They want to eliminate downside. Uh, they want a return on capital employed and a return of capital employed. Uh, they see themselves simply being a source of debt capital. And I think the, the circumstance that you'll see is a much more aggressive, much less aggressive loan to value on behalf of a pure lender uh, and, and much stricter covenants and conditions because they simply want to get paid back. They don't want to own the project. So um, what, what, what is the calculation for someone who, who, who wants to be in that position, loan to own investor? Um, considering, you know, common shares versus preferred versus uh, issuing this debt. Um, what specifically makes them go in that direction, go debt as opposed to some type of senior equity? Well, I think they, the idea that heads they win, tails they win. Uh, if they like the project relative to its development cost, by lending, uh, they have saved themselves having to provide all the equity that got to the decision point. It may be that if a project is being developed for $300 million, it, it took the issuer $150 million to get it to the point where the construction decision was going to be made. Then at $300 million, the lender might put up $200 million, $250 million. The equity holder puts up the balance. If the equity holder isn't, isn't uh, able to develop or service the loan, 100% of the project goes to the lender. The lender may have $250 million put up on a project that has had total expenditures of $450 or $500 million spread over 10 years. So the lender in a loan to own circumstance saves himself or herself the 10 years of development that led up to the construction decision, uh, save themselves the capital that went into advancing the project until a, until a construction decision, and save themselves too the equity that the issuer put into the project in front of the loan. It can be a very good business. Okay, but you have the risk of perhaps not being able to participate uh, in the upside. That's always the risk. Yeah, if, if worse comes to worse, you just get your loan repaid, which is what right. you set out to do. Right. There are also circumstances, and we'll talk about bankruptcy later in this discussion if we get to it, where despite the fact, particularly if you're in the United States and you go into a Chapter 11 proceeding, uh, where just because you're the senior lender, just because you're senior secured, doesn't mean that the court will allow you to continue to be secured. So one risk that even the loan-to-own lenders face is the capriciousness of courts in bankruptcy. Okay, okay. Uh, according to our regular schedule, Rick, we have about six minutes left. Do you have uh, another portion that you can cover in that amount of time? Or are you in a well, position to extend? What should we do here? Uh, I'm perfectly well, I'm perfectly in a position to extend. That isn't difficulty, that's up to you, Albert. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's see. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's continue I'll, the discussion I'll then. I'll do it whichever way you want to do it. Yeah. Okay. So let, let, let's continue the discussion and we'll see if we have time um, beyond that for questions or whatnot. So, so go ahead, please continue. Uh, I think it's useful right now to discuss the components of the capital stack uh, and their attributes. The first, of course, is equity. And I think equity needs to be uh, subdivided into common equity, which is most, most of what you see in preferred equity. The preferred equity generally rates ahead of the common in liquidation, but generally uh, exposes itself to more dilution, which is to say it's usually issued at a premium to the common, may or may not be convertible, but it's uh, senior in terms of liquidation preference, and also it often has a yield. Most people who are listening to this interview probably can uh, constrain most of their investments to common equity. Uh, I often in bad markets prefer to issue preferred equity uh, or rather say buy preferred equity. The beauty of preferred equity is that it doesn't cram down the common shareholder. <laughs>
uh, in as ugly a fashion as raising common equity would, which is to say, if the project is successful, it's a cheaper form of capital. The benefit to me is it's a more secure form of capital. I end up being senior in the capital stack in the event of liquidation, and I often can cover the time value of money constraint with a preferred yield. Uh, when you are talking about equity in the capital stack, uh, remember that you are talking often about the company's current and future cost of capital. And that's really a discussion that involves uh, the net present value relative to the enterprise value. There's all kinds of esoteric cost of capital discussions out there. And I think most of them pale compared to is uh, capital issued at the current price uh, accretive <laughs> or is it dilutive? If you think that the net present value of the company is substantially higher than the enterprise value of the company, you hope that your company doesn't issue capital. <laughs> you hope, on the other hand, that your new investments will issue that capital to you. So the capital adequacy and the cost of capital and the cost of prospective capital are important things to consider in the equity portion of the capital stack. Um, increasingly, uh, royalties have played an important part of the capital stack. Uh, a company which needs to raise money at really any stage of its development now might do that by selling a royalty on the project to a, a royalty financier. A royalty is an economic interest in a deposit, often registered uh, as a security interest on title in the deposit, but it uh, allows the royalty owner to have a piece of the revenue stream of the project without sharing in the capital cost or the operating cost. In other words, for the royalty owner, his or her gross is his or her net. If you assume, as an example, uh, a 5% uh, gross royalty on a project, uh, where a project uh, might have a return on, uh, uh, return on invested capital, of 20%, the royalty owner gets 25% of the economic benefit of the deposit without bearing a capital cost exposure or an operating cost exposure. That can be an extremely valuable proposition to an investor. An investor doesn't have to, a royalty investor doesn't have to concern him or herself with management effic efficacy, with operating costs, with sustaining capital requirements. And the consequence of that is that royal in, royalty interests are often priced at a premium, <clears throat> sometimes a deserved premium, sometimes an undeserved premium. But when you're examining the capital stack of a company and you see a royalty uh, interest in place, understand that the impact on the profitability is going to be much greater statistically than other forms of revenue share because the royalty owner won't bear his or her share of the proportional costs. I have seen circumstances where the sale of a royalty generated 20 or 25 percent of the equity capital that was needed to develop a project. And in that circumstance, particularly in bad markets, it turns out that the lower cost of capital more than compensated the issuers uh, for the uh, margin reduction that occurs as a consequence of the sale uh, of a royalty. Uh, more recently, which is to say in the last 20 years, uh, uh, streaming has been uh, a financing tool in the mining interest. A stream uh, conveys uh, often, again, on balance sheet and on title, the right of the owner of the stream, the, the right of the provider of streaming capital to a certain quantity uh, of a certain metal at a certain price over a certain period of time. It may be an unlimited period of time. So in the classic example, uh, a miner has a, a copper mine which produces byproduct silver. Uh, revenue from silver is priced higher in the market than revenue from copper. Whether it should be or not, doesn't matter, it is. And so the copper miner 
uh, let's say that this uh, copper mine is going to produce uh, a million and a half ounces of silver a year. The copper miner feels very safe that he could deliver a million ounces of silver a year, given that his studies show it's going to produce a million and a half. And he may sell the right to buy a million ounces of silver a year for 10 years, that is 10 million ounces of silver, to a silver streamer. Uh, and he or she would sell would uh, sell this interest uh, for an upfront capital contribution. And then that would give the stream owner the right to buy a million ounces of silver a year for 10 years at some fixed price. Let's call it $10 an ounce, which means that today the stream owner would enjoy about a $9 an ounce premium on a million ounces of silver a year. This circumstance, uh, again, penalizes profit margins in the out years, but it lowers potentially the cost of capital uh, today in terms of equity uh, dilution and may or may not be accretive in the context of net present value over, t over time. It's important when considering the capital stack and considering management uh, expertise and efficacy to determine whether the stream that was sold was accretive to shareholders or dilutive to shareholders. Important too that you determine whether or not the management team's assumption with regards to accretion or dilution were accurate from your point of view. I have examined as an example several streaming deals that the Lundin family has done with extremely sophisticated counterparties. And I have found that given the cost of capital that occurred at the time that the streams were sold, that in the case of the Lundines, the capital was acquired at very, very, very reasonable prices. Sometimes streams as financial instruments are sold in a way that gives the company the ability to buy back the stream at a premium, which is to say that this capital is rented as opposed to sold. These are uh, often attractive features in very long, very long, uh, very long lived very high quality properties, which is to say, you sell the stream, you use the capital provided by the stream to put the project in production, you allow the stream to run for a few years, and then when you can back out that stream at a predetermined price with lower cost debt or equity, you do that. Um, the next category that I'd like to talk about is mezzanine or bridge debt. This is short-term debt, different than project debt, different than permanent debt. Mezzanine or bridge debt is debt that's occurred by a company uh, to overcome a relatively short-term capital need during periods of time when other capital is either unavailable or too expensive. Mezzanine debt is often debt that is junior in security to senior debt. That's why it's called the mezzanine. The mezzanine of a building, as an example, being the floor immediately above the ground floor. So in this case, uh, a company will have perhaps borrowed senior debt or had a senior preferred, and they find themselves a little capital short and are either unwilling to raise that capital or, or unwilling to pay the price that that capital ch uh, uh, might charge. And as a consequence, take out a short-term, usually fairly high rate loan with the expectation that they'll be able to back out that expensive capital over time uh, as the value of the project becomes realized or at least recognized in the market. Bridge debt is different. Bridge debt is usually senior, but the purpose is usually the same. Bridge debt may be used to acquire an asset or partially acquire an asset. Uh, it is, uh, or at least it used to be, uh, commonly used to provide the capital to finish off uh, preliminary economic assessments, pre-feasibility studies, or feasibility studies, which is to say it was used to, to fund what were pr uh, potentially catalytic uh, value additions. Uh, in this circumstance, if the issuer believes that the certainty associated with his or her project uh, will be increased enough from say a feasibility study that they want to raise the money to, to complete the feasibility study by way of debt. Uh, 
hoping that the share price will rise afterwards and then they could raise equity to pay off the debt. That's what bridge debt is about. We've discussed the uses. The risks are, of course, that the uh, value added by the activity isn't sufficient to generate enough interest uh, or that market conditions change to the extent that the debt is either uh, very expensive to repay or can't be re repaid. In that sort of circumstance, it's best to remember that the worst debt on any balance sheet is better than the best equity <laughs> in liquidation. So it's important to understand when examining the capital stack with regards to MES debt or bridge debt, what it was used for, what are the terms of repayment, and what are the probabilities that the uses of that cash uh, were intelligently constructed. The intelligent use of bridge or mezzanine financing can often greatly return, greatly increase, pardon me, return on equity because they imply, they imply less equity dilution but they come at very real risks. The next piece of the capital stack that we need to talk about is project debt. Uh, real estate investors should think of this as a construction loan because that's precisely what it is. When the feasibility study is complete, hopefully not before, when the project is permitted, it's time to build the project. Uh, if you are a $150 million company and you're facing a $350 million bill for building your project, obviously it is unlikely that you will be either Ill uh, willing or able to raise $350 million in equity based on $150 million market capitalization. So you require a project lender. As we described earlier in this discussion, project debt uh, generally has a loan to value, value being established in the bankable feasibility study uh, of between 25 and 35%. That is to say 25 or 35% of the completion cost of construction has to be provided for by equity. The debt will be uh, somewhere between 60 and 70% of total project. It's important to uh, look at the scheduling and the covenants associated with this debt to determine the cost of capital. There's generally three components uh, in the cost of capital. One, there's the upfront discount. Uh, very often uh, lenders are paid a fee for providing the money. This fee might, be, might happen as a consequence of an original issue discount which is to say that a company will borrow $100 million, but only receive $96 million of it, uh, which is to say that the lender, in effect, financed the discount. It might be that the discount come by way of an equity issuance uh, or a warrant issuance, but generally in terms of construction finance, in addition to the coupon, which we'll deal with next, there is an upfront fee associated with the provision of this risk capital. The second component is, of course, the coupon, which is to say the uh, amount of money that's paid directly as rent on the money. Uh, it's useful to know, first of all, what the stated interest rate is. Uh, it's useful, too, to note frequency of payment and the schedule of payment. In certain construction facilities, the payment is, is uh, deferred or picked. Uh, in the case of a deferred payment, if somebody's borrowing $100 million, the interest payments uh, as uh, accrued uh, will be added to principal, uh, which means that the company is paying interest on interest, but they aren't, pay, they aren't forced to pay out cash that they either don't have or they need for other purposes. In the case of picked interest, it's payment in kind, uh, which either means that the company issues, issues additional debt securities or they issue equity to the lender. Finally, of course, uh, there's what's called a KISS. Uh, in most construction loans to non-investment grade companies, which is to say loans that are recourse only to the project, in addition to the upfront payment and the coupon, the lender gets some form of bonus. Uh, it might be a small royalty. It might be the ability to buy some of the product produced, which is to say, in effect, a stream. Uh, it might be a synthetic interest in the profitability of the project. Uh, 
uh, it might be debt and or equity in the uh, issuer. But it's important to note the components of this construction loan, the upfront fee, the coupon, and the KISS. In terms of de determining the total cost of capital, but also the terms and conditions by which this capital has been advanced. It's important to note too what the events of default will be, what the successful completion test will be, and in particular, whether there is a line available for cost overruns. In other words, if the assumptions that went into the original uh, construction aren't met, will that constitute an event of default? Or has the lender anticipated this and provided for the availability of an accordion facility. Uh, in other words, is the lender willing to finance overruns? And if so, on what terms and conditions? If it sounds complicated, it's because it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I told you we'd get in the weeds, uh, and that's precisely what we're doing. Uh, unfortunately, for most of our listeners, this knowledge is going to be necessary. They're going to have to employ it to make money in the sector. The next part of the balance sheet stack that I want to talk about is offtakes. There are circumstances where in particularly commodities traders, the traffickers of the world, uh, the Louis Dreyfus of the world, the triple flags of the world will pay a company an upfront fee for the right to market the offtake, the product of the mine at a discount. So it might be that uh, in exchange for an upfront fee, a copper miner gives a, a commodity trader the ability to take 100% of the copper out output of the mine at a specified marketing discount to world market. It's this marketing discount and the net present value of that marketing discount that the investor needs to take in, into consideration. Because this discount uh, is in effect a royalty, these discounts are very often net of every other cost, which is to say the smelting cost, the transportation cost, everything else. The marketing fee is a royalty. And the way that the marketing fee is calculated uh, is also useful. Uh, often in contracts, what the, um, commodity trader will negotiate with the mine owner is the ability to price the product uh, for purposes of the offtake discount uh, at the price that occurred in any of the prior 30 trading days, which is to say that the marketer gets the ability to choose as the reference price on the contract the lowest spot price that occurred in the last 30 days, not necessarily the price that occurred on the day that the copper was delivered. In that circumstance, what otherwise looks like a three and a half percent discount may be a four and a half or five percent discount because commodity prices are extremely, extremely uh, volatile. It doesn't mean that offtake agreements are bad. It means that you need to examine the offtake agreement as part of the capital stack. Uh, and examine how sophisticated or unsophisticated management were in terms of selling the offtake agreement and try to anticipate the impact of the offtake agreement on the future net present value of the contract. How are we doing for time, Albert? Are we able to keep going or do you want to defer this? No, we, we can keep going. Um, right. Is this a good time to ask you a question or do you have a couple more uh, layers uh, to address here? Let me, let, me get through, let me get through a couple more before we do that since okay. we're on a roll there. Yep. Uh, I think that the next thing that investors need to look at in terms of the capital, capital stack is debt conversion uh, or economic conversion. Um, mezzanine debt or bridge debt, it's important when you look at mezzanine or bridge debt to understand the provisions in the loan uh, around conversion and around default. How does the company plan to pay this off? And is their plan for paying it off consistent with the structure uh, of the loan document? More importantly, probably with construction debt, with project debt, what is the uh, requirement or what is the availability of takeout financing? It's very 
uh, very common for construction financing, reflecting the risk of con uh, construction, to carry a total cost of between 12 and 15% per annum. You seldom see that show up, by the way, in the coupon. It's hidden other places. But it's very common for construction debt to be 15% money. Upon successful completion, which is to say after the, after the mine has been built and, and after it has uh, attained nameplate capacity and has begun to generate cash flow, after the risks uh, have been ameliorated, what are the provisions in the loan for that construction debt to roll over into lower cost uh, senior debt? What is the availability of the company to pay off or prepay the loan once they have access to lower priced money. So it's important to understand uh, the proposed structure of conversion from high cost debt to lower cost debt once de-risking has occurred. I've seen circumstances where issuers had to continue to pay 15% interest two years after economic completion when their cost of capital should have been seven or eight. Uh, very poor contracts with regards to uh, the management team. Speaking of management teams, an important part of understanding the capital stack is liabilities that you never see, which is to see, say, employment contracts and employee obligations. Uh, in the event of insolvency or bankruptcy, what you find out is that some of the unstated liabilities uh, of the company which is to say management contracts, become senior to every other uh, interest secured or unsecured in the company, and certainly secured uh, to the shareholders. The other reason that you need to consider employment contracts to be part of the capital stack is very often, if you're buying a company because you believe that the company will be sold, how much of the sales comp uh, compensation will the management team receive? I've seen one particularly egregious circumstance around a development stage in pro property in Brazil where the management team by contract would receive five, year, five times their average compensation over the last five years in the event of a change of control, which is to say five times their salary, five times their bonus, and five times uh, all of the rest of the payment incentives, like their healthcare costs. What that actually means is that the management team has an incentive to see a lower share price so that they can sell the company more easily and get their cash bonus. It's important to note that management contracts by themselves are also part of the capital stack, always in the liability section, never in the asset section. The final thing to consider in terms of the capital stack and capital adequacy is what happens in the event of liquidation or bankruptcy. There are jurisdictional differences. Preferably, if you're a lender or a bondholder, you want to be in an English common law jurisdiction. You want to be in England, you want to be in Australia, you want to be in uh, New Zealand or uh, uh, Canada. You want a place where the duty of the court is to liquidate the assets for the benefit of creditors as has been established by a prior contract. In the United States, bankruptcy is particularly dangerous because the court has jurisdiction to liquidate the estate for the benefit of stakeholders as is determined by the court, which is to say the court has the ability to rip up existing documentation and reorganize priorities. So it's important to note, particularly if you're a bond investor uh, or if you are a shareholder in a royalty or streaming company, if you are a shareholder or have an interest in the obligations of a, comp of a company, a capital provider, it's useful that you know something about the jurisdiction uh, of the issuers that you've invested in so that you can anticipate something that might occur by way of bankruptcy. It's important too to to recommend, as, to, pardon me, to understand as we've discussed before, employee preference in bankruptcy, uh, and also the, the so-called supremacy of communal interest. That's a real fancy way of saying that the tax authorities, and the licensing authorities, and the permitting authorities will have first pick at the carcass, before the creditors will, before the common shareholders will.
So I think it's important in looking at the capital stack. Uh, I, I realize that people don't want to consider bankruptcy, that they don't invest in anticipation of bankruptcy. But I think it's important in terms of analyzing your downside to think about what happens with regards to the capital stack in the event of difficulties or bankruptcy. And that covers it, Albert, probably in more depth than anybody wanted to hear. Uh, that's very good, Rick. Um, I, to, to the people out there who noticed Rick smiling during part of that explanation, uh, Rick can see me even if you can't. And uh, having not got much sleep lately because my wife is traveling and I'm doing parenting and whatnot, he caught me in a yawn. Uh, not because I wasn't enjoying the content, content although I, I'll, I'll say it's, um, I wouldn't describe it as riveting. It's very interesting and useful, but uh, that's what that yawn was, Rick. I got five hours sleep last night. Um, I, but I, I do- you were paraphrasing the audience's response. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, so, so I do have a couple questions. This could actually be, you know, a three-day workshop, um, and maybe one day it will. Um, but let me ask you just um, maybe a couple very broad questions, and that is uh, the first one is about management sophistication, and I'm wondering um, with with so much flexibility uh, here in the financial in the ability to financial financially engineer one's capital stack. Uh, management sophistication seems of utmost importance. And I'm wondering if I gave you a, a company, uh, sort of a black box company, and just showed you the capital stack, um, there are probably things that you could infer uh, about the management or the asset or something like that. So what are things that you could see that would maybe be red flags in your mind? And you already discussed the management contracts uh, which is uh, pretty much easy to understand. But what about the other things? What what kind of things would uh, raise flags in, in your mind? Usually you need to go one step beyond that, Albert. Usually you need to construct a management interview and you need to ask them on what assumptions the decisions were made. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you expect the management team to get every single decision right, but you want to understand that there was a framework for decision-making. Uh, that was reasonable, that was accurate. <clears throat> I think I've told you before many times when I've asked companies <clears throat> about their plan for answering unanswered questions, they told me very frankly they didn't have one. Uh, to them, the unanswered question was, could they raise the money to pay their salaries for the next 18 months? They didn't say it to me in quite that blank a fashion. But obviously, in most circumstances, there was a complete failure to plan. and. I think if you look at a capital stack that, first of all, is inadequate, that's the most common failing. Uh, in other words, in the discussion that we had earlier about a preliminary economic assessment that needed to be upgraded into a pre-feasibility study, you'll recall that we said it would take $8 million to complete this uh, and two years, $4 million for the work, $4 million to keep the company alive. If you look at a company where there's no provision in place to raise additional money and they have $2 million, it's fairly unlikely that you're going to get a yes answer. If getting a yes answer is going to cost you $8 million and they only have two, $2 million. So the inadequacy of capital is the first red flag uh, and it's a real red flag. If you go away from the balance sheet to the income statement, Albert, uh, I think if you see a circumstance where there is excessive general and administrative expense relative to project expenditure, that's a real red flag too. If you and I were to sell uh, an exploration venture to a major mining company, they may allow us a 12 to 15% general and administrative expense allowance. It's very, very common for small exploration companies to run general and administrative expense that exceeds 50% of total expenditure. It's difficult to get a reasonable return on capital employed if the capital that you've provided is not being employed. So a different place that you look in terms of capital adequacy uh, really is the disposition of the capital that was provided by the capital stack. Um, does the existence of, or what does the existence of mezzanine debt tell you about sort of the circumstances? Is this uh, due to unforeseen circumstances? Um, it, and it, it, it may a, be opportunistic. I mean, I've had uh, 
absolutely top tier financiers, the Lundin family and Robert Friedland approached me about mezzanine debt because they were so certain of the probability of success and so disgusted with the cost of equity capital at that period in time in the market that they were willing to take short-term debt that didn't convert to equity at fairly high rates because they were convinced that their time value of money was very good. They were convinced that the either the time they would buy or the progress that they would buy would be so well regarded by equity markets, so well rewarded by equity markets, that the total cost of capital for this ex fairly expensive and certainly risky debt was worth it. There will be other circumstances where it's fairly common that the attempt to raise mezzanine debt has to do with the ability of management teams to pay themselves a salary, <laughs> uh, a, a less welcome use of capital. Okay. Um, and then uh, maybe you could comment a little bit on the jurisdictions, um, the unstated liabilities. Um, from the experience of sort of American auto companies and airlines that have gone through bankruptcy, I think we have seen exactly uh, what you pointed out there is a pitfall. Well, I think that's right, Albert, as you know, but most of the listeners won't. Uh, I was I involved as a practitioner in oil and gas bankruptcy for years, uh, which is to say I helped liquidate companies in bankruptcy. And I could tell you a series of horror stories, which would cause you now, 30 years later, to laugh. But believe me, they weren't funny for the participants at the time. The circumstance that you're talking about, I think in particular, was in the bankruptcy of uh, General Motors, where the United Auto Workers specifically contractually subordinated the pension liabilities of the auto workers to the bondholders of General Motors to do two subsequent bond raises that kept General Motors in business. In the bankruptcy, uh, the tax court, uh, upon application by the United Auto Workers Union, tore up those contracts, as a bankruptcy court can do, and uh, reorganized the priority, putting the pension holders, despite the fact that they had contractually subordinated themselves to the bondholders in first place, and forcing a cram down on the bondholders, which is to say the bondholders didn't receive all their principal while the employees received all of their pensions. Irrespective of your political point of view, Albert, or your social point of view, it is a risk to you as a bondholder to become made retroactively subordinated uh, in bankruptcy court. And it's precisely the kind of thing that happens again and again and again in the United States. Very often when I practiced uh, oil and gas bankruptcy, uh, we would <clears throat> hear the bankruptcy before a judge that had been elected uh, in a local constituency. And a local constituency in Louisiana or Oklahoma or Texas very often favored the interest of unsecured local product vendors and suppliers, which is to say voters and campaign contributors, over the interests of shareholders, joint venture partners, secured creditors, or bankers. Despite the fact that the unsecured creditors had no rights um, by contract, which is to say they weren't secured against any asset at all, the judge, because the judge had, lat had latitude to liquidate the estate uh, for the benefit of all stakeholders, reorganized the status of the state uh, of the stakeholders to suit his or her interpretation of the circumstance and the need. And that's a risk that investors must bear, particularly in credit situations in the United States, where the rule of law is subordinated to the rule of expediency in bankruptcy. Interesting. Very interesting. So I've got one more question for you, Rick, and then I'll leave it for the community uh, to come up. I'm, I'm sure they're going to come up with many questions based on this episode. Uh, but my last question is, um, most investors will participate via common equity, uh, royalties or streaming. Uh, some will participate in private placements. Are there convenient vehicles for uh, retail investors to participate in these other components of the capital stack? You have to do it indirectly. Uh, as an example, Sprott 
is a, a very large uh, project lender. So a common shareholder in Sprott Inc. participates uh, indirectly, uh, at, at least in construction financing. It's been an important constituent, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, an important part of Sprott's ability to pay the generous dividends it's paid over the last 10 years. Uh, certainly, it is possible for retail investors around the world to buy uh, both investment grade and non-investment grade bonds issued by mining and oil and gas companies to participate either as subordinated uh, holders in junk debt or senior holders in uh, off balance sheet financing uh, or as senior creditors to investment grade companies with bonds on the New York Stock Exchange. You can participate too indirectly in royalty and streaming by owning equity in any one of the, what is it, 29 or 30 uh, publicly traded royal and streaming, royalty and streaming companies that we identified and, and discussed in the royalty and streaming part of the classroom series. Okay, perfect. Uh, with that, Rick, I think we should sign off here. I uh, look to forward to seeing you uh, for the next part of this discussion, uh, either a continuation of this or maybe a discussion of pre versus post tax uh, issues and political risk, which is on our schedule. Uh, so I promise I will be back enthusiastic and, and better rested than I was today, Rick. Uh, but thank you very much. And I look forward to next time. Thank you, Albert. Sadly, I don't promise to be more succinct. <laughs>